Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 113, Oxford. War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Miners. This week, we're going to talk about what's been happening since the Oxford High School shooting on November 30th, 2021. Though it's only been a week, it's clear that Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald intends to criminally charge anyone that she feels contributed to or could have stopped the rampage before it happened. While the shooter was the one who entered the high school and pulled the trigger, there are other individuals who contributed to this to the events on November 30th, and it's my intention to hold them accountable as well. It's imperative we prevent this from happening again. No other parent or community should have to live through this nightmare. I have shared previously, and I will reiterate today, that gun ownership is a right. And with that right comes great responsibility. Before we get into the deep stuff, and in an effort to be as helpful as I can to my listeners who celebrate Christmas, let me remind you now that it's right around the corner and that you still have time to gift someone you love with a story worth. The online service that helps you and whomever you choose to gift capture precious memories and family stories to preserve for all time. Each week, your chosen story worth recipient will get a thought-provoking question of your choosing via email such as what's the bravest thing you've ever done and after a year it's all compiled into a lovely keepsake book for everyone to enjoy for generations with story worth you're giving the ones you love the most thoughtful personal gift from the heart and preserving their memories and stories for years to come go to storyworth.com warbaby to save ten dollars on your first purchase that's storyworth.com slash warbaby to save $10 on your first purchase. For the past few years, shootings on school campuses have remained steady, but 2021 has been off the rails, according to the Center for Homeland Defense and Securities, which have recorded 222 incidents of gunfire on school campuses so far this year. Oxford was actually the second of three school shootings that took place over two days. A few hours after the Oxford shooting, a triple shooting took place at the concession stand of a basketball game at Humboldt Junior and Senior High School in Humboldt, Tennessee, in which one person was killed. And the day before, on Monday, November 29th, at my nephew's old high school, there was a shooting that turned out to be an isolated incident. So when news broke the next day about another on-campus shooting, I figured it would be similar news. But Oxford is turning out to be much different than the ghost gun purchase gone bad at Cesar Chavez High School the day before because the evidence reportedly points toward a premeditated attack. A total of 10 students and one teacher were shot, and four of those innocent Oxford High students lost their lives that day. 14-year-old Hannah St. Juliana, a student athlete remembered by her father as being, quote, one of the happiest and most joyful kids. She loved learning how to cook and always had time and kind words for everyone. 17-year-old Madison Baldwin, a talented artist and eldest of three who had her pick of colleges to attend. Her family is encouraging acts of kindness be carried out in her name and memory, which can be shared online using hashtag Maddie Matters. 16-year-old Tate Meir, the youngest of three boys who wrestled and played football for Oxford High School while maintaining a 3.9 GPA. He died in a police car as officers tried to rush him to a hospital. 
and 17-year-old Justin Schilling, an honors scholar who was on the bowling and golf teams and who worked at a Middle Eastern restaurant as one of his three jobs. Justin survived until the day after he was shot, dying in the hospital on Wednesday, December 1st. His family kept him on life support for several days so that his organs could be donated. What's been reported so far is this. On November 26th, the day after Thanksgiving, 45-year-old James Crumbly went with his 15-year-old son Ethan, a sophomore at Oxford High School in Oxford Township, Michigan, to Acme Shooting Goods in their town and purchased a Sig Sauer 9mm handgun seemingly for himself because to do otherwise would violate federal law. Later on that Black Friday, the teen posted a photo of the gun in its case to his Instagram with the caption, quote, Just got my new beauty today, Sig Sauer 9mm, with a hard eyes emoji, followed by, quote, Any questions I will answer. The bio section on this account read at the time, quote, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds a direct translation from Sanskrit of a famous passage from the Hindu scripture the Bhagavad Gita, followed by, quote, See you tomorrow, Oxford. The following day, Saturday, November 27th, Crumbly's mother, Jennifer, inserted herself into the situation when she posted to social media, quote, Mom and Sunday testing out his new Christmas present with another photo of the 9mm. The pair visited a local shooting range together. Two days later, on Monday, November 29th, the teen returned to school from Thanksgiving break and got in trouble, getting sent to the counselor's office when a teacher caught him looking at pictures of bullets in class. He told them that guns were a family hobby and that he and his mother had just gone shooting two days earlier. The staff called and emailed her, though they didn't get confirmation about his story until the next morning. In the meantime, she texted her son, quote, LOL, I'm not mad at you. You have to learn not to get caught. Later that night, evidence shows that the teen grabbed his cell phone again, but this time used it to record two shocking videos that described how he wanted to and planned to shoot and kill other Oxford High students at school. He detailed the same in a journal, which investigators would later find in his backpack horrendously disturbing um obviously talks about what he intends to do and and the kinds of things he's thinking about um it's just uh, chilling the next day when he went to school tuesday november 30th he had the gun with him the teen immediately found himself in trouble again this time when a teacher saw a piece of paper on his desk that depicted a drawing of a gun, a drawing of a figure that appeared to have bullet wounds, plus the words, quote, the thoughts won't stop. Help me. Blood everywhere. My life is useless and the world is dead. His teacher snapped a photo of it and took him directly to the counselor's office for the second day in a row. It took them a while to get a hold of his parents, and 90 minutes passed until the Crumbleys arrived for a meeting, during which time their son was questioned and observed. He'd already scratched out or altered much of what was on the scrap of paper, but said that it all pertained to a video game he was designing. The counselors tell the Crumbleys to take their son home for the rest of the day, and they inform them that they have 48 hours to get him in some kind of counseling or the school will be required to notify CPS. He wasn't suspended, though, and since he didn't have any prior disciplinary infractions, the counselors decided he could just go back to class instead of leaving with his parents and getting dropped off at an empty house. The Crumbleys refused to take their son home because they were going back to work. At no time did the school resource officers speak to or search the Crumbly teen, nor did his parents notify the counselors that he had direct access to a firearm. The counseling office handled all of this within themselves and never notified the assistant principal or the principal. So just after 10 a.m., he went back to class and his parents went back to work with no one realizing that the Sig Sauer 9mm handgun was in the teen's backpack. Less than three hours later, at 12.50 p.m. during a passing period, 
Crumbly emerged from a bathroom and began shooting down the hallways and through classroom doors, injuring the students and teacher. He reportedly shot individuals at close range and tried getting into locked rooms. Some students escaped the campus by jumping out of first-floor windows. Over 100 calls came in to 911 and word spread quickly. 31 minutes after her son shot 11 people and just a handful of hours after leaving the conference with the counselors, Jennifer Crumbly texted her son, quote, Ethan, don't do it, at 1.22 p.m. Her husband had heard too, but drove home and checked the unlocked drawer in his bedroom before calling 911 at 137 and saying the gun was missing and that his 15-year-old son was the likely Oxford school shooter. Within five minutes of his stepping out of the bathroom shooting, Crumbly was taken into custody without incident, setting the gun down and putting his arms up when he saw police. Crumbly appears to have fired 30 shots and had 18 remaining rounds over two magazines. The following day, Wednesday, December 1st, the teen was charged with one count of terrorism, four counts of first-degree murder, seven counts of assault with intent to murder, and 12 counts of possession of a firearm in the commission of a felony, with the addition of more charges a real possibility as the investigation continues. We have seen no evidence of bullying. I personally talked to the anti-bullying coordinator for the school. He wasn't on their list, on their radar. Their focus, obviously, is to prevent bullying and to hear about any child that may have been bullied and to take appropriate actions. He was not on their radar or um, one that had been brought to their attention. Um, We have not directly heard from any other student as the investigator of this uh, tragedy that he had been bullied. But I also want to say this. Why bullying's terrible and we investigate it and it should never happen. Nothing that we saw on that day, the tragedy and taking these lives and, and uh, marring forever everyone else could rise to any kind of acceptable response to anything that he felt um, had happened to him. But again, we have no evidence that he was in fact bullied or had any um, kinds of activity in that front. The teen was ordered held without bond and moved from juvenile detention to the jail since they also determined he'd be tried as an adult. His mom and dad attended the arraignment over Zoom from their car. Within two days and by Friday, December 3rd, the decision had been made to charge the alleged shooter's father and mother with four counts each of involuntary manslaughter. Based on the information and evidence I have received, today I am announcing charges against the shooter's parents. Jennifer and James Crumbly. I want to be really clear that these charges are intended to hold the individuals who contributed to this tragedy accountable and also send a message that gun owners have a responsibility. When they fail to uphold that responsibility, there are serious and criminal consequences. We need to do better in this country. We need to say enough is enough for our kids our teachers parents for all of us in this community and the communities across this nation any individual who had the opportunity to stop this tragedy should have done so the question is what did they know and when did they know it I have tremendous compassion and empathy for parents who have children who are struggling and at risk for whatever reason. And I am by no means saying that an active shooter situation should always result in a criminal prosecution against parents. But the facts of this case are so egregious. Reading this document, looking at it, reading the words, help me, with a gun, the notion that a parent could read those words and also know that their son had access to a deadly weapon that they gave him is unconscionable and and I think it's criminal. It is criminal. When you give your child access to a deadly weapon, when you indicate that you're buying a weapon and you sign that it's for yourself, yet clearly based on the, the statements of the shooter, the statements of mom, that was his gun. 
The news of the Elder Crumbly's charges broke early on Friday, December 3rd, and they were scheduled to turn themselves in at 4 p.m. They'd already retained counsel, with one of them hiring Larry Nasser's former defense attorney, though their son had been assigned a court-appointed attorney to represent him. Instead of showing up to their own arraignments, the couple allegedly turned off their phones and withdrew $4,000 from an ATM not too far from the courthouse and fled to a downtown art studio of an acquaintance, artist Andre Sakura. He said that the pair showed up on Friday and asked if they could hang out there, as they'd been receiving threats since their son had shot up his high school. Sakura said that he let them in not knowing they were wanted or that a manhunt was underway. He told police that he left at 5 p.m. and that the Crumblies were supposed to leave as well and lock up behind themselves, but they didn't. They stayed in the studio and hid in the basement. They were found there at about 1.30 a.m. after an intensive 11-hour search that was aided by a citizen who saw their Kia SUV parked in his downtown Detroit building's parking lot. Security camera footage showed Jennifer Crumbly going into the studio where they were soon found. She'd actually been nearby when her car was spotted and the 911 call was made and she'd taken off and run back into the building, which was what they saw on the video. Their bonds were set at $500,000 each and they both pleaded not guilty to four counts of involuntary manslaughter, which carries a maximum sentence of 15 years in prison. The charges are very seriously, but as the court is aware, they are allegations at this point. As Ms. Smith has stated, both of our clients are presumed innocent unless they're proven guilty, Um, Your Honor. And quite frankly, from what we know, Your Honor, the facts are not what they've been presented to the court and to the public. Um, Our clients are going to fight these charges. Our clients are just as devastated as everyone else. There is no doubt it is the worst thing the Crumbleys have ever been involved with in scene. Considering that Jennifer Crumbly had penned an open letter to Donald Trump that she posted on her blog, stating that the protection of her Second Amendment right to bear arms led her to vote for him, it's difficult to think that she didn't know that minors in Michigan can't legally possess their own 9mm handgun, or that it's a federal offense to knowingly purchase a gun for someone else. Federal straw buyer charges are reportedly being weighed in that regard, but no charges for fraudulent gun storage are relevant in this case because Michigan has no such safe storage laws. On Sunday, December 5th, it was announced that the Michigan Attorney General's office had offered to conduct a, quote, full and comprehensive review of the shooting and of the events leading up to it. However, Oxford Community Schools declined announcing that an independent third party would conduct the investigation. Here's Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel. I think if people really want to trust this investigation and to know that it's comprehensive and to know that we've covered all the bases in terms of making a determination of what led up to the shooting and what happened during it uh, and how we can best work together to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again, It really should be our department that's handling this. This is not about pointing fingers. It's not about blaming educators. It's not about blaming the school district. It's just finding out what happened here. Moving forward, we can ensure that we have best practices and best policies to address these types of concerns to ensure that this never happens again. All three of the Crumblies are being held separately in the Oakland County Jail, while the artist, who is suspected of helping the parents hide, is under criminal scrutiny himself, with a search warrant being issued for his home and devices to determine if he knew that the Crumblies were wanted by the police. Criminal charges against members of Oxford High School staff are also under consideration. He's already been interviewed for hours and actually went to a police station in Troy, Michigan, a police station in downtown Detroit, and also the Oakland County Sheriff to offer information once he heard of the Crumbly's arrest on Saturday, December 4th, according to his attorney. The investigation into Socorro's potential involvement is ongoing. Potential criminal charges against members of Oxford High School staff are still being considered as well. As of Wednesday, December 8th, 
Oxford Community Schools remained closed with a half-day scheduled for next Friday, December 17th, to slowly acclimate the many likely traumatized kids to being back. A Change.org petition seeking 300,000 signatures is currently at 265,000 and is seeking to change the name of Oxford High School football field to Tate Mere Stadium. As always, thanks for listening. I usually say don't be scared, but this time, how about lock up your guns? <laughs>